Okay, well, I guess we'll uh, get started then. Uh, I want to thank uh, AIA for allowing me to come to their seminar and uh, present uh, a topic that I think uh, is going to be uh, in the future in our new agricultural uh, uh, landscape here. Just a little bit of background, you got my bio there and stuff, but uh, what I'm seeing of when I do a lot of seminars, last year I spoke at 23 producer seminars throughout uh, Western Canada and down in Ontario, and no matter where I go in the country, it's still the same thing. Uh, we have to have land to farm, but then the old model of the first born German son gets all the land ain't going to happen anymore. And so I spoke at Farm Tech uh, three years ago to about 1,700 producers uh, at one time, and I had those clickers where you vote. So I asked this question How many in the room today, if I opened up your wills today, are leaving land, who, sorry, who have a child farming with you today, are in your will leaving land to a non farm child? Okay? What's the re what was the reaction, do you think? What percent? 90, 50, 88, 89, okay? So when I look at farmers, look in their, their succession plans and their estate planning, almost 90% of my clients are going to leave land to a child of theirs who's not actively farming. Next, next observation, it's kind of unique. How, who are the largest farmers, which organization structure is the largest farms in Canada? Well, what's interesting, there's this philosophy that farmers all have what? And we've got to make that still kind of work once in a while. Bib overalls and a pitchfork, right? <laughs> okay. And uh, so what's interesting, a lot of the farms in Alberta are larger than the major large Hutterite colonies. Okay. Now, why are Hutterite colonies so competitive and buying up all the land in Alberta the last few years? Pardon? They only buy it once. That's my model here. So what's happening is once that, uh, and I, I'm not being biased at all, but that structure, an ownership structure, allows them to compete way more than anyone else when you fracture these lands up, correct? And so one of my uh, challenges by some of my producers, and it was interesting this morning, some of your talks, you know how conservation easements work? You'll see these ranchers, like in the press a couple months ago, the Waldron Grazing Association sold their land for $27 million, right, to the Nature Conservatory of Canada. And then the farmers who have that grassland, what do they do? Use it for perpetuity, right, to run cows. So what you see, some of the ranchers around Cochrane, I live at Cremona, they've approached me and said, you know, I got 27 quarters, this one farmer I work with, 27 quarters, $27 million, a million dollars a quarter, three children, right? 89-year ranching operation. He's so frustrated, he would love to someone come along and put it all into nature conservatory so it would be kept as a ranch forever. His family could farm it and ranch it, but then they would never be able to fracture it. Okay, so that's where my premise is coming back a little bit of what can we do in this structure. So I'm not going to make you tax experts, so I'm going to, I didn't realize I had only 40 minutes, so I'm going to go pretty fast on this. <laughs> Agriculture is the most Unique class of taxpayers in the world, in Alberta and Canada. Right now, I'll give you a little bit of an example of that. If I own, if I own a $10 million oil company, let's back that up. I did. I own a $3 million oil company today. If I transfer those shares to my children, I pay tax on any share value over a million, correct? Because we all have a million dollar capital gains exemption. In agriculture, I could have a farm worth 50 million and transfer it to any child of mine resident in Canada and pay no tax. Okay? So that's one reason why we have this unique ability to transfer assets to the next generation and pay no tax. And that is another reason why the barriers of entry in our industry is what? Huge. Not one of you in this room could buy a grain farm in Cremona and go farming tomorrow. Unless you're growing something different. We do have a marijuana industry now started at Cremona, but you can't get in there either. So what I'm trying to get at is that on the special farm tax provisions, these are what we have. We have a million dollar capital gains deduction, but we also have an unlimited ability to roll over property to the next generation, whether they farm or not. And that's the key. I can transfer my land to my daughter tax-free, correct, or my son tax-free who isn't farming. In my farm seminars, a, a, a little bit of a joke, I say, yes, you can leave land to your son married to a liberal in Ontario. <laughs> that, that, that was a joke, right? But it does availability. The gross revenue test, I won't go through it too much. You don't need to be tax specialists. 
I'm not going to go through all the tax rules, but this is what I'm saying is the children can have it as long as a child is a resident of Canada. If you transfer land to a child who is not resident of Canada, there is no rollover. Okay? So what does a rollover mean? If I bought land in 1971, where I work, uh, uh, Bill and I are from Cremona, was $185 an acre. Okay? Today, it's 5000 an acre. Anybody, anybody, want, anybody want to guess what the TSX did from 1971 to today? It's 15 times. Uh, land in Alberta has went up 30 times. So if you take the, the change in value from 71 to 2016, the TSX, well now it's down to 13.5, but it went hit this 15, right? Thousand was the top of the TSX. So land as a long-term investment has been double what the TSX has done. But now for this one here, the list of people who qualify for the uh, exemption includes child, grandchild, great-grandchild, adopted child, stepchildren, and their spouses. So what that means is as a tax haven, the investment, land, besides its long-term capital appreciation, gives me the best tax advantage of any investment I can make in Canada. Correct? Let's go with that again. If I buy stock market for a million bucks and it goes up to five million over 30 years and I sell it, I pay tax, correct? If I buy farmland at, at five million and goes up to 30 million, and as long as someone in my family farms it, there's no tax. So that's why there's quite an incentive. I remember years ago, I talked to an oil man in Drayton Valley. I went, he went to one of my seminars. And he says, you telling me I can buy land, leave it to my kids, and pay no tax ever? And I said, yep. He bought seven quarters next week. That was, that, that's a true story. Because he didn't realize the tax incentive in our industry to own land. It's huge. Absolutely huge. Um, next question here on this one is, if anybody uh, doesn't have children, my joke always is, just adopt somebody before they're 18, right? So I'm sorry, I'm over 18, so it's not going to work for us. But just, I'm going very fast, get the background of why land is so important. And uh, I'll give you an example of my talks. I always ask this question in the room. Say there's uh, 100 farmers there. I always use this example. The government just socialized land ownership. You can't own it, okay? <coughs> it's taken off the list. Remember the gentleman that this morning talked about property? You know, there's land rights and there's property rights. I don't own land rights. None of us do it on land in this country. We, have prop we don't have property, we have property rights, not land rights. So there's a, dis there's a difference, of course, and Graham knows for sure. Make a long story short, where I'm going with this is that when it looks into land, I always have this one scenario. Gentlemen, we socialize land ownership. Ladies, you can't own anything except the home quarter. Okay, that's gonna be the new rule. However, the government will let you farm it for half of the fair market value of rent forever. How many in the room want a farm? Okay. Well, how many people put their hand up out of a room of 150? Usually three. And they're all under 18. <laughs> Correct? The rest of the people in the room aren't true farmers, really, you think about it. They're land hungry capitalist pigs. <laughs> because we're trying to accumulate land. Correct? That's the whole purpose of our culture. And we don't love farming that much, to be honest with you, but we do love what we can buy, which is called dirt. Correct? That's really what we're excited about. Okay, here is something that I'm using right now to promote my farmers to do something. I, I love doing seminars because one of the questions I asked, uh, I want you to read this, and then I'm going to ask you a question. This is from an investment seminar in Calgary that I went to about seven months ago. Uh, it was done by uh, Maurer Investment Company in Calgary. So it's nothing to do with agriculture, but they had a great talk about Western democracies and economics going forward. Okay, just read this. Uh, you guys can all read this. We expect the issue of global inequality to remain pronounced in forthcoming months. Not surprise us if the political pendulum, which in the 80s moved away from labor towards freer market capitalism in Western democracies, swings back to models focusing on greater redistribution of wealth. Indeed, we see this around the world. This guy here coming up scares me. If you ever want to read a book, read this one. It's Thomas Piketty. He's talked about capital in the 21st century. He's a French economist, a labor economist, who's saying that we're going to have to tax wealth to solve our problems on debt in the Western democracies. There's just no other way around it. Anybody going to increase the GST? Good luck. Bring in a provincial sales tax? Good luck. Are we going to increase taxation rates on corporations? No. 
Can't do that, or we'll drive them out. Third thing we've got left to do is what? Tax wealth. Picardy has come back and said if they started taxing wealth, that they could get rid of all of the uh, debt in all the economies within 15 years. So, and his question is, and this is the one that started to scare me when I read this, inherited wealth is the problem. The 1% that he's trying to attack, the 1% that Bernie's trying to attack, are farmers in that 1%? Not on income, no. Are we on wealth? Bloody rates, correct? Uh, the average farmer, if you look at the stats of uh, Canada, the average farmer is worth about 1.8 million minimum, right? In Alberta, I would say it's probably 2.5, right? Actual dollars that they're worth, on a buddy who grosses over 100,000. So, inherited wealth is the problem. So, backdrop to my talk about wealth, uh, inherited wealth is farm transitions. I'm getting the attention of some producers to do something potentially now before the world starts to change on them. I always do this question in my seminars. What are men really good at? Ladies, you have to answer this today. What are men really good at? Same answer everywhere, nothing. <laughs> Correct? Well, we are really good at something. That's procrastination, doing nothing, right? If I could work with mums in the traditional family farm succession, I could have this done in about two meetings. With men, it takes me five because right, we're just slowly, slowly to do things. So, here's some interesting stuff. Since I knew I was coming to an AIA conference, had to have more graphs. Uh, they talk about where the money's going. Well, here, the rich is 10%. This is, 20, this is 211. This is 1975. Their share of the wealth, right? Taken off like crazy. This is what some of the economists are saying about our social redistribution of wealth. They have made a lot of money. Next one, middle class. Declining shares to mid-90s, the last 15 years, pretty well flat. And here's the sad one. Going from 17% down to about 12, 12 and a half down here, which is a lower 40% of the population has not went forward. These graphs are in Piketty's book, talking about how we're going to have to start doing something different if we're going to have uh, uh, a Western democracy that can survive. What's interesting in the Maurer presentation, they showed throughout history in Western democracies, why don't we have riots? No, what it is, is that if you go back to the 1910s and, and, they, and the Roosevelt come in in the United States, you can show 30 years of capitalism, correct? And then to keep everyone kind of in tune, we have 10 years of socialism and redistribution of wealth. Then we go 30 years of capitalism again, 10 years of redistribution to let the, let the areas keep going. So we're always trying to make sure that the middle class and the lower class don't revolt on us. I'm not being me personally, just this was the, the comment in this, in this presentation. So, where am I going with this? If farmers, I'm saying, what could happen is if we don't do something of addressing the rollovers and the capital gains exemption, what would happen if they changed the rules overnight? If all of a sudden, those farmers I talked to you have $30 million or $20 million of land assets, if they transferred to the next generation and had to pay tax on that, what would land values do? Tank. tank. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? If I'm trying to start in the industry, it's thing. damn right, it's great. It's what time those capitalist pigs got their tax rate. <laughs> if I'm a seller, it's rotten. Okay? So I'm not trying to say what's right or wrong. I'm just giving you what's happening. So what's, what's interesting, in the United States, I'm going to focus on this one. In our United States, they do not have a rollover of farm property. If you have $20 million of land in the U.S., give it to your kids, you pay tax, but their exemption is $5 million per person. So if mom and dad could own $10 million of land and transfer to the next generation and pay no tax, okay? Or to anybody. Not, not, there's no intergenerational rollover down there. So my concern is really this one. If the farm rollover was eliminated or capped, are we going to see... Uh, a lot of farmers not too happy, of course, the ones that are trying to transfer their land to the next generation because they're saying they're, on, they're not getting paid for it, are they? If I transfer land to my daughter, I'm not getting paid for it. It's just that the system isn't making me pay tax on it. The argument farmers always have had is why should I pay tax on something that I haven't received cash for? A little bit of history. This rollover wasn't in the act in 1971 when the capital gains rules came in. It was made retroactive from 73 back to 71 because farmers had a real hissy fit paying taxes on land transfers that, of course, was not converted to cash. Okay, so 
Where I'm going, that's a little bit of an idea of what I'm trying to get across is farmers have to do something, maybe look at some ways to transfer their wealth to the next generation sooner and not fracture land ownership so much between four or five siblings. So a little bit of background here. Here's the US thing. There's a, you guys have maybe heard of an economist maybe from the States. I had the luxury of meeting him five or six times at Farm Tech. His name is Dick Whitman. And Dick talks about their farm going from 2,000 acres to 17,000 acres up to 24,000 acres now. He talks about buying out three generations of owners. And I said, well, how did you guys didn't fracture it? Like, how come it isn't split up among five or six different cousins, uncles, the whole nine yards? And he says, because of our tax system. I said, cool. What do you guys got? Well, down in the U.S., they can use trusts. A trust in the U.S. says if you put an asset into a trust, it can stay in that trust forever. When it stays in the trust, it's never taxed. Okay? So if I put a half section of land in the U.S., leave it into a family trust, there's never a tax on that until that trust is wound up. It can go for 100 years. Okay? Anybody here familiar with uh, mineral right titles? And you're, you guys would know that in our industry with mineral rights and stuff. Okay, now, in Canada, we don't have that ability. If we put land into a trust, it has to be wound up in 21 years, okay? And that's because of a little family called Bronfman's in Toronto, caused this about 1968. So in other words, we are not going to allow Canadian taxpayers to put wealth into a trust and never have the gain taxed, ever, right? So every, every 21 years, we have to bring the assets out and then if they're sold, pay the tax on them, right? Okay, just give you a little example. So in Dick's situation, I'm not going off, it's, he talked about this at Farm Tech and not private information. In their deal, they have like a mineral right title almost. They have 24 owners of the trust. Only 19 of them are farming. Or sorry, only three of them are farming, correct? There's 19 cousins or uncles or whatever are capital beneficiaries of the land Correct. So the, the trust rents the land, of course, to the operating companies, and there's three of them up top. But the landowners get rent, economic rent, of course, we're all familiar with economics. But no one gets to have their individual quarter section to sell. The trust has rules, and one of the rules I love in there, because I'm a farmer, is this last one. If you want out, every, every, organ, every business structure has to have a liquidity point, correct? Right? or else you're going to have a, a war. So in, theirs, in their agreement, they made this agreement. This is the trust agreement. If anybody wants out, you value all the land, you take your units, take the land, knock it back down by half, and of that half, you get 25% down, the rest over 15 years at no interest, and no longer an income rent. So they have a huge, absolutely huge penalty kicker if you want to convert the family trust, in a sense, he calls it that, of owning land for, for generations into cash. Okay? So a huge disincentive if you ever want to sell it. In Canada, all I can do, going back to my model, is in Canada, when I do my succession work, all I can do is say, if you want to leave land to your son who's not farming with you, that's cool. To protect the business, I'll have a lease in your will that says, I leave the quarter section to my uh, son Norman, who's not farming, on the condition that he leases it back to uh, GRS Limited for, say, 10 years. So someone else owns it, but the business has guaranteed access, correct? But in land law in Canada, I cannot restrict him from selling it, ever. I have farmers telling me, yeah, I want that land going to Norman, my son living in Calgary, but he can never sell it for 100 years. And I say, Dad, how old are you? 98. Right? It ain't going to happen. Like, there's no way we can restrict in Alberta our ability for you to sell or not sell real estate. I can put a lease on it, but I cannot restrict the actual sale. So with that tool, I'm kind of stuck again with having the land, what? Fractured. This is what, this little diagram I've used for 24 years. It's still the best one i ever come up with. On this side is family farm succession. This is the transfer of the operating business. On this side is your personal wealth. Land is a personal wealth asset. It's not a farm asset, is it? Not really. Land is a personal wealth asset. How much land is rented, do you think, in the province of Alberta right now? People that farm, it used to be 40%, I'll say it's up to 46. That's changed about 10% higher in the last few years where most of my clients, 30 years ago, farmers owned 75% to 80% of the land they farmed and they rented 20. Now it's more like I own 60 and rent 40, correct? 
because the scale scope of farming has increased in the ability to put in hundreds, you know, thousands of acres with an air drill. So on this side, with my succession, I always focus on the operating company, how to create a viable business. Then I say we have to have access to land. And my third thing I always talk about, which is kind of uh, the old way of doing it, was all the land goes to my farming child and all of the other assets go to my three daughters equally. Okay, now, if this is only worth two million, and this is worth 10 million, how much is in here? If I had it dr drawn by graph, right, it'd be this little dot right there, <laughs> right? I mean, farmers may have half a million dollars of RSPs when they're 68, but they're half a million dollars here compared to their 10 million here and two million here and three kids. You can see the, you can see the dilemma, right? They're not gonna leave $11 million this way and the girls $100,000 each, correct? It ain't gonna happen. And I'll tell you, it ain't going to happen because I've seen these wills. It does not happen. So to carry on, what my talk is, is I want to start having the farm community. I cannot create a family land trust, but I can create a family land partnership in Canada that does the same thing as a trust. That's the key message out of this room today. So what I'm trying to get across is take this land, and I have a couple farm. I've had two done so far. That's it. But it's going to come where that they take their land, they put it into a partnership. If in Canada, I cannot put land into a trust when I'm alive without having a deemed sale. So go back to my example. If I have $10 million of land and I want to put it into a US style trust or a Canadian 21 year trust, like I'm talking about, I get a deemed sale at 10 million. Boom, can't use it, can I, right? I'm already saying to the government, I'm willing to pay tax on 8 million to put it into the trust, that ain't gonna happen. So. We can't do it. And I'll give credit where credit is due always. This is Greg Gartner with Faleski Flynn's idea. I love the gentleman talking about some of the data stuff. He says, accountants are brilliant, but they don't know how to ask the right question. Just like a lot of technical people in your math example. So my question to Greg was, Greg, I need a structure that allows me to keep ownership as a family unit somehow, like a trust. And he says, well, use a partnership. I said, why didn't you tell me that 20 years ago, you turd, right? <laughs> because this is kind of, I think, brilliant on his, on his behalf. So what we're doing, taking land, put it in a partnership. Here's what happens. You take dad's land, put it into a partnership. Him and mom, if that's 10 million, they put 10 million of the partnership. The partnership gives them back $10 million of paper, correct? Partnership interest. In my discussions with farmers, I use per acre. You know, if you got land worth $5,000, Put the five, you put the acre into the partnership, you get a unit called $5,000 unit, right? Acre, per, acre for a, a share. It's not a corporate share, it's called a partnership interest or a unit. The parents keep all the income, of course, and the kids, here's the deal. The three children or four that are farming and non-farming, I put them all in the one box, doesn't matter, farmers or non-farmers, we're all children, correct? They get the growth units of the asset. So let's put the, back this up. We put $4 million of farmland in here. The partnership allocates the income to mom and dad primarily. These guys get to own the growth units. So if looking at my talk about the tax that could happen in the future, right? Remember I talked about the government starts taxing farmland values? If I do that today and they make a rule that when you die there's an estate tax in Canada 10 years from now, that's $6 million of growth. Who owns it? The kids. So we've already got rid of that potential growth. What farmers want in succession, guys, is this. I want my children to own it. They never bitch about the transfer of equity, or else they all sell out today. What they want, though, as all parents, is what? Control, right? Because they're scared of the four Ds, I call it. There's four Ds that scare every farm family in the world, and that is, first one, divorce. My son and daughter gets divorced. Second one, debt, if I give them the land too early. Right? If I give uh, Norman a quarter worth a million bucks for 100000 today because I can roll it over to him, what, what does he do the next day? Borrow a bunch of money, right? So he loses it. The next one is, is uh, so there's divorce, debt, disposition. I give it to him for 100 turns around and sells it on me for a million, and walks off for 900000 yeah. I will hunt him down, but he has done it, right? And so those three, and the, and the last one is death. If I give my son this land early and he dies, where's the land go? Maybe to his wife, right? Which is my daughter-in-law, which I don't necessarily like. <laughs> okay? So this structure that Greg come up with, I kind of like it, 
because here's some examples of it. So here's just a quick one. Dad takes 14 quarters, rolls it into the partnership. He receives class C, which is the present land value, describes for A units, which is the income unit. And here's my example on this one. The one I've actually did is this one. At this time, because Dad is concerned about the tax changes and he wants to make sure the land stays in a unit, he's saying, I don't need this much capital back to me. Remember that 10, you know, the 14 quarters at 500,000 a quarter is 7 million? A paper, correct? He's saying, if I die tomorrow, I'd still die with how much paper? Right? 7 million. So what he's done is decided to transfer 40% of that the day after this partnership was created. So he put the land in, got the $7 million of units back, gave 40% of that to his kids the next morning, which is allowed under the rollover rules. So now the kids own 40% of the $7 million. <coughs> okay? If I give them 40% of actual land, I'd have all these four Ds to worry about, correct? If it's in the partnership, who runs the partnership? Dad. Actually, Dad thinks he does, Mom does, right? But it's still that way. So 40% of this, uh, this actual farm is by Camaros. 40% of the land is in the kids' names today. But it's controlled inside the partnership, just like it was controlled inside of a trust, correct? And so that's what we've done. And the partnership has entered into a lease agreement with the two companies. Dad has a company and his son has a company. The partnership has entered into a, believe it or not, 40-year lease agreement. So for 40 years, if this companies exist, right? Because if dad dies up here, or the son dies up here, and he leaves that operating company to his children, there's still a company that lives, correct? Right? Companies don't die. So this partnership has a 40-year lease back to the companies up here that are the active corporations. Okay? So 40 years, this thing's tied up. Everyone thought that was cool. The, the, the five kids have said, hey, we're cool with that, right? As long as we get our rent, correct, from the operating companies, we are getting something from our family's inheritance. And I'm hoping that down the road, if they get that, maybe they won't want to flip it and sell it, correct? And if they do want to sell it, I can have the same rules as Mr. Whitman had. If you want out, whew, it's gonna, you're going to take a big hit on your equity coming out if you want out early. So here's the kind of the end, the gentleman's standing, so that means I gotta sit, is dad controls, dad and mom I should put in there, control as managing partner. There's no valuation issues of who's fairness, right? Should you get, you know, let's be honest, the family that did this, I'll be honest, the son who's the farmer got more than one fifth of the partnership units of the 40%, okay? I'm not trying to be all beautiful in here, and there was a little bit of an argument about that, but I'm just gonna show you more of a quick example. Here's the big one, though, down here. No ability for a child to apply to the courts for partition. What does that mean in English is that if you and I, you, if us three own land together, correct, and we say, we're all, you're, you're my sister and my brother, I don't mind you, I'm not nor my brother, oh. <laughs> but if us three own land together from our parents and uh, that rotten bugger wanted to get his third out, and I, we said, no, you can't sell. He can go to court and force us to sell. It's called partitioning a title. In, under, Al, under law in Alberta, if you have a partnership unit, right, a third, 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 we can't do that. So effectively, the, the structure ties us up a whole bunch more than if we had a third ownership of a piece of title. So I kind of like this idea. Uh, I think we're gonna start using this because of the fact that some of our farms, the last client I talked to on this owns 3,000 acres and farm, rents five. Well, he is pretty cognizant of the fact that it's bad enough chasing the landlord's land for future access. He doesn't want his family to chase the land that his grandfather, his father, and he has put together over three generations. I think if we can get creative here, I'm trying to get the idea of owning land as a long-term investment is great, and the rates of return exceed the GIC rate, correct? 5,000 acre land at 100 bucks an acre in our area, right, is still 2%. It's still better than the Kamona Credit Union at 0.85. So, and, and down the road, here's the best part about a partnership. I'll end with this. <coughs> if those two operating companies ever quit farming, correct, we all hope down here they do, because when they do, we can sell all the land.
correct? If we wanted to. If we sell all the land, all of those people that own those units all, ca all qualify for a million dollar exemption, right? They all do. If I had six brothers and two nephews and three, you know, as long as it's being actively farmed by a member of the family, all those units qualify. And if we, do, don't, if we don't get along, here's the best part is, if we want to, it's not a trust, if we wanted to and say, nope, this is crazy, the developers are, uh, we're in that black soil zone, they're going to offer us 10,000 acre to use it for, for uh, houses, which I disagree with, but they did. We all could sit back and say, nope, I want to keep my two quarters. You guys sell your five. We can wind the partnership up, take all the land out of the partnership with no tax. So I'll end with that. I can create it, control it, and wind it up with no tax if I want. But I'm trying to come up with a way. I'm, I'm bringing this up at some select seminars to farmers to say, guys, we may want to look at land capital partnerships rather than fracturing this land that took three generations to compile.